everyone. Welcome to the Awareness to Action Enneagram podcast, a podcast that focuses on our distinct approach to this amazing system of understanding human nature. My name is Mario Sakura, coming to you from Philadelphia, and I'm joined by Maria Jose Monita. Hello from Santiago, Chile. And Tamar Zanati. Hello from Cairo, Egypt. We are partners at Awareness to Action International, a consulting firm specializing in practical applications of the Enneagram. You can find out more about our work at awarenesstoaction.com. In this season of the podcast, we are focusing on exploring each of the three instinctual biases and nine strategies through the lens of a movie, looking at one movie that we feel represents the essence of the bias or inia type. So make some popcorn, sit back, and enjoy the program. Hello and welcome to the Awareness to Action Enneagram podcast, season one. The focus is the Enneagram in a movie. I'm Mario Sakura, and I am here with my partners, Maria Jose Monita. Hi there. And Tamar Zanatti. Hello. We are going to be talking today about the preserving instinctual bias and looking at it through the lens of the movie Castaway with Tom Hanks. What we've been doing in this series is looking at different dimensions of the Enneagram model, starting with the instinctual biases, and then we're going to move on to looking at each of the nine Ennea types. And we're focusing on one movie that exemplifies the uh, theme at the heart of the instinctual bias. Now, again, our focus is not on whether or not the characters m- meet the profile, but whether the theme of the movie meets the profile. And I think it's pretty fair to say that the movie Castaway certainly does meet the theme of the preserving bias. What do you guys think? Too much. (laughs) (laughs) Uh What do you mean by that, Maria? That That I found myself struggling to see anything else. And Mm -hmm. I'm sure that there was, but there was a lot of preserving there. Yeah, and, and I think this is consistent with the other movies we've looked at, right? I mean, when we looked at Saturday Night Fever, it was from beginning to end a movie about transmitting. And we found the same thing with The Breakfast Club, beginning to end. It was a movie about navigating. And I think, again, we have the same uh, phenomenon going on here. There's not much else that's talked about in this movie beyond things related to the preserving domain. How about you, Taryn? Yeah, it's, it's a movie about survival. So, so what else? I mean, what other uh, domain would you would you see highlighted in the movie? I mean, definitely, as uh, as uh, Maria you were saying, there there are like traces of other domains, but absolutely the the uh, survival mode and uh, the coziness, uh, the family theme, uh, uh, even the way uh, almost everybody's dressing is so preserving. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Tamara, and touching on the idea of relationships and family um, and a few other things that we'll touch on, exemplify how our approach to the preserving domain is a little bit different from how other Enneagram teachers approach it, right? Um, the We don't call it self-preservation for very specific reasons, and uh, primarily because it's about preserving more than the self. It's about these automatic, instinctual behaviors that cause us to create order in our environment and protect our resources and create a sense of stability uh, in our lives. Now, all these things lead to survival, but it's about more than that. And it's not just about survival of the self. It's about preserving of things that, uh, that creates a greater chance of survival. Uh, lo- at least long enough to procreate, right? I always tell people that nobody lives forever. Okay? You, you don't see any 200-year-old people walking around. So uh, we are not designed specifically for self-preservation. We are designed to instinctually do the things that will help us live long enough to ensure the um, sustainability of our genes. Let's talk a little bit about the preserving domain. And as we described last time, we break each of the three, each of the domains into three subdomains, and then the three of those subdomains into further, three further subdomains. And the way we think about these instinctual biases is that they're clusters of evolutionary impulses. This movie demonstrates some of the ones 
that are not talked about in the Enneagram literature, particularly around relationships. And also, I think, is a good reason. It'll give us an opportunity to explain why so many people mistype themselves as sexual or one-to-one subtypes when they're really preservers. That's a big theme in this movie. So the preserving domain, the first subdomain we break it into is the um, domain of safety, right? Uh, I'm sorry, is security. And security entails a number of different things. So there's physical safety that's involved, but there's also the security that relationships give to us, the stability of family, the stability of having that significant other with us creates a sense of security in this domain. And there's also an issue of risk avoidance. Okay? How can I protect myself? How can I not overextend into danger zones? Yeah, it was uh, interesting for me to see how Wilson became like the devil's advocate, the, the mm-hmm. volleyball. In their conversations, he took the role of, it took the role of showing all the things that could go wrong. Yes. Great point. Great point. I hadn't thought of that. All right. We'll talk more about Wilson. For anybody who hasn't seen this movie, Cast Away, we are going to give away the ending. Okay. We're, you know, look, the movie's been out for over 20 years. If you haven't seen it yet, it's not our responsibility not to spoil the ending for you. So bear with us. And uh, if you don't want the ending of the movie spoiled, stop here, watch the movie and come back to it. But uh, we're going to continue on. So the other area that we talk about is uh, well-being and resources. Do I have the things that I need in order to be comfortable, to be healthy, to be to be prepared for whatever might come my way? And that includes the subdomains of comfort, trying to create some comfort for ourselves. The issue of supply, having enough of the things that we need, and then our health. And again, all three of these themes come through in this movie, for sure. And as we've mentioned before, they don't have to be skillful at them. And you can see that in the movie, how he talk, Chuck talks about certain health issues, but doesn't do anything about it until it's right. just exactly uh, urgent. Yes, exactly. The toothache, uh, the, yeah. it's probably an abscess yeah. tooth. And as someone who has had an abscess tooth before, it is a painful, painful thing. And to be on a deserted island with one of those would be a pretty awful uh, experience. And the solution was awful experience. <laughs> Which, one of the most horrible things I've ever seen in my life, yes. But, uh, <laughs> but, but we'll come back to that. All right. So the, uh, the third subdomain in the preserving domain is maintenance. It's repairing the things in our nest, okay? Repairing our tools, repairing uh, the things around us that keep us safe and comfortable and, and well-supplied. It's about traditions. Something that we see often in preservers is this desire to preserve traditions. It might be holidays, it might be family activities or traditions. Just this sense that things are continuing as they did in the past, right? So there's kind of a a small c conservatism in the preserving domain of wanting to hold on to the things, almost wanting to stop progress in a way so that the holidays don't change or our traditions don't change. Yeah, and, and most part of the movie at the beginning, before the accident, it's around the holiday. Exactly, exactly. And then finally, there's tending to the nest, right? This uh, tendency of all of us to want to feather our nest a little bit to make sure that we have the things that make us comfortable, a comfortable chair, you know, uh, the things around us that make us feel warm and safe and comfortable and at home, at ease. They create peace of mind in a sense. Okay. Anything you guys would add to the descriptions of the preserving domain that we didn't talk about here? No, actually, we will we will be covering. I mean, almost all of these categories and subcategories in different. Uh, I mean, all of them are covered in the movie, so uh, you know, we'll be talking a, a lot about them uh, throughout our discussion. Yeah, the, the thing that I would add is that preservers. There's this pattern of expression with preservers that makes them have uh, less of navigating and then neglect or uh, being different to transmitting, but also for navigators, there's a 
reaction or a bias towards uh, preserving. Uh, and I could feel that throughout the movie. Just as a reference to the preserving domain, you mean? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So for a navigator like, like I am, preserving is the least important. It showed for me when watching the movie, I could feel myself getting distracted uh, because it was just like, okay, come on, how much more of this can I <laughs> endure, you know? And but when when I watched uh, the Breakfast Club, I was so engaged because right. I was interested in every part of it. Right. And then with the Saturday Night Fever, I was conflicted. I kind of felt kind of drawn to it, but then oh, it's too much. I would never right. do that. Right. So I could feel those things with the movies, um, just as I do in real life. I mean, I mean, and, and, and what you're saying is making lots of sense. I enjoy um, I enjoyed Castaway and. Uh... Actually, I had I had to watch watch it a couple of time uh, to to for to prepare for this podcast, and uh, I did not uh, complain because I watched it even before a couple of time before the preparing. So it's like, yeah, that's interesting. I can do this <laughs> if I got lost in, a, in an island. I can do this. <laughs> it, it, it's funny because my reaction was, I'm dead on the plane. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm not getting out of that plane when it goes into the ocean, if it's me. Right. And uh, so I think, Maria Jose, we are having this uh, emotional reaction to this this movie uh, in the same way that Tamara felt about The Breakfast Club. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and so so what Maria Jose is saying, just to, to uh, reinforce that, is that uh, for preservers, th th there is this pattern of expression that we find to be consistent and steady in each of the instinctual domains. And so for preservers, it's what they're into, right? It's like, oh, this stuff, I eat this stuff up. Uh, the navigating domain is I'm drawn to it, but I'm conflicted. And I think we see this in the, the Chuck character played by Tom Hanks, um, particularly when they're, they're talking about his co-worker's wife who has cancer and when they're first discussing it in the beginning and the, the, the other woman's discussing it with the coworker, and you can see Tom Hanks's discomfort with this social situation and this awkwardness, right? So I think there's that, but you know, he should do something, say something about it, but he doesn't know what to say. Exactly. He finally finds something to say, which was awkward, awkward anyway. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. And th there's nothing about transmitting in this movie, right? I mean, the, the except maybe the uh, the woman yeah. with the package of the wings, she was yeah, kind of a transmitter, wings. right? Yes. Yeah, but uh, you know, she was kind of a a disconnected character in in, in, a, in a way. So she she was a plot device, quite frankly. Right? And with navigators, it works differently, like Maria Jose described. Uh, navigators just. The zone of indifference is in the preserving domain. So a lot of navigators will look at this and say, all right, when is something interesting going to happen? Okay. I know that for me to get through this movie, uh, let me say this. I saw it in the theaters when it came out, and I liked it. I think it's a well-made movie. It's interesting. It's engaging. It's suspenseful. And what I liked about it is that it doesn't take the easy way out at the end of the movie, right? I remember walking out of the movie with the people I saw it with, and they were saying, well, why don't they get back together, right? Why doesn't he get with this other woman? There has to be a happy ending. That was depressing. And that's one of the things I liked about it, that it was willing to say, you know what? Sometimes life sucks, and sometimes there's not a happy ending. There's just a ambivalent ending. So I, I liked that about the movie. Um, but get, you know, watching through it this time, I became most interested in a philosophical conversation about suicide. You know, if you read the existentialist philosophers, particularly Camus, you know, Camus said that the only question to ask is, do we or don't we commit suicide? And I think that was a theme that kind of ran through this movie right, in a lot of ways. And we'll come back to that. Again, the movie is cast away. Starring Tom Hanks, it was uh, released in December of 2000. Made 233 million dollars at the box office. So it was a successful movie. Directed by Robert Zemeckis, who has made a lot of great and popular movies, such as Forrest Gump, uh, Back to the Future, Contact with Jodie Foster, and The Polar Express was another one. He's well known for special effects, and uh, I think the special effects in this movie were really good. Right, I think that you believed, or at least I did, 
that Tom Hanks was in the middle of the ocean in a storm and all of these things. So I think they did a really great job on on that. Star Tom Hanks, who was kind of at the height of his powers at that point as an actor. And I remember um, he was on an award show or an interview at some point while he was filming that movie. And he showed up and he had the long hair and the long beard. And they had actually taken time off in the midst of production for that movie for, I think, six months or so. So he could go through a dramatic physical transformation, which he he does during the movie. It was well well received uh, by critics on Rotten Tomatoes. It gets an 88% score from the critics and an 84% score from the audience. So I think it's interesting that the critics rated it a bit higher than uh, the fans did. A couple of interesting reviews I found online. Uh, One of them was, though Hanks comes across as blandly as ever, at least his solid performance shows he's up to carrying half a movie on his own. And Zemeckis' direction is at first as busily efficient as the protagonist. Um, Not a glowing review. Another one from New York Magazine says, Hank's everyman quality has never been more aptly utilized. Uh, He's the perfect stand-in for all of us who never made it to Eagle Scout. Uh, Finally, Hank's conducts a master class in acting by showing a man losing his sense of himself in fractional gradations. All of these, I agree. Not a lot of actors in this movie, right? There's not a lot of uh, characters mm-hmm. other than Hanks. And go ahead, Even that's it? preserving. Even that's preserving, right? There's just a lot of people around, right? So, uh, <laughs> uh, so um, other than Hanks, the only kind of uh, well-known actor actress is Helen Hunt, who plays Kelly, his uh, girlfriend, and I assume about to be fiance uh, before he gets on that airplane. There are a couple of other actors who are co-workers. And then the only other actor I recognized was Chris Noth, who played Mr. Big on uh, Sex and the City and has been in a number of other things. But even he has a small part. Uh, now, I'm not counting Wilson as an actor mm-hmm. here. Um, and um, But, uh, you know, got to give a shout out to Wilson the Volleyball um, as a main character in the film. Okay. Uh, let's see here. That's all I have to say about the movie. It's nice to not to have to give content warning for the first time in our podcast. I don't have to warn warn about any politically or you know politically incorrect comments or scenes or anything like that, other than pure existential dread uh, as something you should be prepared for as you watch this movie. So, what's this movie about? Well, basically, Tom Hanks plays an. Ex- um, I don't know what exactly his role is, but he works for Federal Express, and it's his job to make sure things get to where they're going on time. You get the sense that he goes around to different places and helps set up the uh, delivery centers. He has a a girlfriend, Kelly, played by Helen Hunt, who, you know, it seems to me they're about to get married uh, when he leaves to go on one last task for the year. He's going to, I forget where he's supposed to fly to. And the plane goes down. It goes into a bad storm. So it crashes. He is the only survivor. It's a harrowing survival. And the plane crash scene is pretty awful and pretty nerve-wracking. And I know, Maria Jose, you're about to get on an airplane tomorrow. Uh, tell, Tell me about your reaction to that scene. I just wanted to stop watching the movie. I mean, it was the last thing I wanted to see before getting on a plane. But yeah. yeah. Yes. After uh, what I mean, after seeing the island and the water and all of that, I just kind of forgot about it. <laughs> yeah, right. So he does survive the plane crash, and he ends up marooned on a deserted island uh, somewhere in the South Pacific. He then has to go figure out how to survive, how to first how to try to get rescued. So he is trying to figure out how to get rescued, and that's not working out so well. So he's trying to figure out how to survive. Uh, eventually, he does make it off the island. He builds a raft and finds his way 500 miles later into a shipping lane where he's rescued and he's reunited with Kelly, sort of. We'll describe each of those scenes. So as as we've done before, we picked out a, a few scenes, but again, it's kind of hard to draw a harsh, harsh line between, uh, you know, the end of one scene, the beginning. And the, and the first scene was the um, opening scenes in Moscow where he is working with uh, 
uh, looks again like a new delivery plant and he's helping them come up to speed. Uh, so I'm curious what you guys saw that meets the preserving domain in that scene. This scene or actually most of the movie is about FedEx. And FedEx is like a company <laughs> about logistics, operations, and uh, and it was very well presented in this opening scene. I mean, the logistics, the the time, the f- factor of time, and preparing the process uh, when the uh, truck got stuck, and uh, like building makeshift line uh, in the middle of the street, and so on. So it's really it's like setting the scene for a very preserving movie through the opening scene. Yeah, yeah. And speaking of FedEx, it is the, the movie is kind of a commercial for Federal Express, right? And even the CEO of Federal Express, the founder, Fred Smith, makes a scene or makes a, uh, an appearance in the movie. And so um, speaking of commercials, I think this uh, let's why don't we take a quick break? Awareness to Action offers a unique approach to applying the Enneagram professionally with leaders and organizations, as well as for personal development. What makes us stand apart is our Enneagram expertise and focus on understanding human nature. We know people because we see people. And this is a skill set that can be taught and learned. Human nature is complex and simple at the same time. Our mission is to help people see clearly and act accordingly. Why? Because the ability to see ourselves and others clearly and honestly is essential. It enables us to act in more adaptive and useful ways. The multicultural team at Awareness to Action will help you learn tools and practices to become more aware and also to understand and engage people more effectively. Learn more at awarenesstoaction.com. Join us at 2021 for exciting learning opportunities. Okay, so we're back. We're still talking about the op- uh, the beginning scene of Castaway, and Tamara talked about the logistical orientation of the movie. There's a lot of talk about time, a lot of talk about process and structure, and this is at the heart of um, the preserving domain. Brie Jose, go ahead. It caught my attention when he talked about the sin of losing track of time. Yes. It's just the worst thing ever, and all the things that could happen if we're late. And it's all the preserving stuff, like food will decompose or papers will not get, get on time, adoption papers, I think it was. Right. So it's all these things that they keep in mind that it is important to do something about it. Yes. Yeah. So as all preservers, it's not only to think about it, but to do something about it. Yes. And he makes sure that people do. That's an important thing. And and Tamara already made the point that just because somebody is paying attention to something or focused on it doesn't mean they'll be skillful at it. I do know preservers who can't make it on time to a meeting, right, or who don't keep a a calendar very effectively, but they still think about process structure and time and agendas and schedules are part of that. Even though I am not preserver, I'm pretty much a fanatic about time and and about schedules. And uh, but that comes from a different sort of place than the preserving domain. So we want to make that distinction. Don't think that you can't be a preserver just because you're not obsessed with time, like Chuck Nolan is in this movie. Okay, uh, but it does represent this thing. And what it does is, as Maria Jose was saying, it sets the foundation for the fundamentals of life. When he opens the box in Moscow and says, look, this took 87 hours to get here. You know, it's only a clock. But what if it was something important, right? Like you said, adoption papers, your paycheck, or fresh boysenberries was the other thing that he listed. And again, these are fundamentals of life. These are all preserving things. That's what he's thinking about, right? Of, uh, food that we eat, uh, important documents about family and money. The other part that kind of signaled preserving to me was when he opened the backpack to give something to the kid, right? Do you guys remember what was in the backpack and what he what gave? Wasn't. What yeah, wasn't? He gave, <laughs> I think candy and some electronic thing. I think he gave him a Walkman and, uh, and a Snickers yeah. bar or something like that, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But he opened the backpack and it was just filled with stuff. Again, a preserving thing of having excess research now so this is a good point okay because uh we haven't talked about tom hanks's or the character chuck's enneagram type yet and his subtype because not all preservers will be hoarders right some will only want to have exactly what they need but the key is that they are 
focused on ensuring I have what I need. Now, some enneotypes or some subtypes of the Enneagram will be more likely to hoard resources, to hold on to things than others. Uh, and I think he was one of those subtypes that's most likely to do that. Uh, do you guys have a view on what you saw as his subtype? Yeah, well, I was wondering, and his emphasis on kind of tracking things made me think of maybe preserving aid mm. because of how he was controlling every step of the process uh-huh. and having the, the uh, discomfort talking about his colleagues or his, the, the other guy's illness. So I was wondering between eight and yeah. three. Eight and three. Okay, Tamara, I, I have a sense that you disagree. What, what do you think? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm just maybe leaning toward three with his uh, wanting always to exceed the, the bar. I mean, improving the time, uh, like pushing people hard to, I mean, working, working, working a lot, traveling a lot. And uh, like asking people to improve the process, and it all, it was all about time and so on. So, so um, I feel more uh, toward uh, three. I think he was a preserving seven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, come on, right? Uh, you know, look. Uh, first of all, it's Tom Hanks. Okay, he's a funny guy. He's making jokes, speaking quickly. Right, everything's light. The discomfort with the suffering of the mm. wife of the friend, the coworker. Uh, just this, you know, yes, an obsession over time that you might not see in every preserving seven, but that was his job. Okay. And so it was all for me, uh, just scream preserving seven. Hmm. So Interesting. That, that Makes sense. Yeah. What's that? Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but you know, hey, I could be wrong. <laughs> so <laughs> it happened once. All right. So. I would like to say something about the opening scene as well. Yes. Um, and you can see uh, the repair part, trying to repair the process, uh, uh, pointing what needs to be fixed. This is the time. It takes more time. So let's work on the process. And then would come the scene of the stuck truck, uh, the tra- truck stuck uh, because of um, uh, this thing. It that was they- booted, yes. Yeah, it's yeah. booted. So, so it's like going immediately and work on fixing the process again and putting a table in the middle of the street and getting people working on fixing the process and yes. repairing it. So, so this, uh, this, that, that actually I noticed this uh, in, the, in the opening scene. And there was, a, for me, an energy to him that felt very frantic. Okay. Uh, and it wasn't methodical like I would see in a preserving three, I think, and, and, and or a preserving eight. It was this bouncy sort of, you know, jumpy, nervous energy that came through over and over again for me. But yes, g- great point, Tamara, about the logistical element. Also, Maria Jose, you already referred to the family Christmas dinner scene that uh, captures that idea of tradition and uh, consistency. And also there was the conversation. There were two main conversations at that dinner table. The first one was, how many boxes did you ship today? And how many boxes did they ship the first time? And, you know, FedEx started on a card table in Fred Smith's basement or his garage or something. And they were joking, I think, about bronzing that table, right? Of Again, creating a, a memorial to the past in a way. And the other conversation is, you know, when are you going to marry her? So, again, we get these themes that are related to the preserving domain. Now, just because they were talking about marrying doesn't mean that it was a so called one to one relationship, right? That's not what it was about. Go ahead. Now, especially when you see the following scene when they are at home and they're in the sofa and they're kind of warm, tired. Yes. It's no, not intense at all. Right. It, it's absolutely yeah. kind of about comfort. Yes. I think he was sleeping, in fact, right? He, yeah, he was sleeping. sleeping. And, yeah. So, yes, warm, comfortable blanket is yeah. you know, the analogy for the relationships in the preserving domain. I, I don't know if you re- noticed, but the news were on and they were talking about Santa being fit to fly. Oh. <laughs> even, even the news where <laughs> we're preserving you know i'd never seen uh something said i mean heard something said about santa being fit or not you know yes. 
<laughs> so I didn't catch that. But one thing I did catch the last time I watched it, because I did watch it two or three times in preparation for this uh, podcast, <laughs> which I'll never do again. But um, <laughs> anyway, uh, what kind of irritated me the first or second time I saw it was, how did he know so much about sailing, right? I mean, come on, right? I mean, how did he figure all this stuff out? But then in that same scene where they're laying there on the sofa, they scroll down and they show pictures of him sailing and an award. And it's so subtle that I missed it uh, multiple times because it always bothered me a little bit that he knew so much about how to, you know, track the winds and chart a course to get off the island. So, but it, it was it was a nice, subtle scene. The other part was when uh, they're in the Jeep and he's about to leave and get on the airplane and they sit down and they both plop open their file of faxes, right, to, to, to plan when they're going to fit in all the things they have to do. And they exchange gifts and the gifts. Do you remember what the gifts are that he yeah. gave to her? Bath yeah, he <laughs> yeah, bath towels, which he said were a joke, right? A pager. <laughs> a pager. Uh -huh. In, inside the Russian doll. <laughs> inside the Russian dolls, exactly. Uh huh. Yes. Um, a journal. A journal, right? To write her memories in, apparently, to again yeah, preserve. But, but although he says that they're a joke. No, I, he said the hand I, towels were a joke. Yeah. Yeah, but go ahead. Yeah, but even if everything were a joke, I wouldn't think of those things as a joke. Exactly you know? right. I would think of other things. Exactly right. It's a preserver's idea of a joke, right? Yeah. 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 It creates a kind of a pattern of what, what do I focus on in life? Uh, yes. Uh, even in a, in, a, in a joke when I create a joke. Yeah. Right. And do you remember what she gave to him? What they call this? The watch or? The uh, pocket watch. Pocket watch, yeah. With her uh, picture inside it. Yes. And he loved it's it. it. Yeah. Yes. And who had owned the pocket watch before, do you recall? Her grandfather. Her grandfather, exactly right. So it was a family heirloom. Yeah that she was passing on to him, again, capturing this idea of tradition and capturing this idea of intimacy. And he even said, oh, that's my favorite picture of you. I took that picture. Yeah. Which again, we see as a preserving activity, right? This idea of capturing memories in some way as comforting. Activity. And, and, and this uh, pocket watch uh, kept on being uh, uh, like a line for the whole movie. Yes. just to represent the relationship and the warmth of the relationships and yes. the longing for the person and a kind of another wilson i mean it's like bringing her inside uh, his life on the on the island uh, so some, some sort of you're absolutely right tamar and both her picture and wilson and even more than her picture but she in general represented a lifeline to him this security that we see in relationships for preservers. And I think we can talk a little bit more about that, but let's take a quick break first. Are you interested in learning more about our approach to the Enneagram? Go to awarenesstoaction.com and check out our certification program. We offer a clear, concise, business-friendly, and science-minded approach while maintaining the depth of traditional approaches to the system. At Awareness to Action International, we're the leading innovators in the theory and pragmatic applications of this system to all aspects of the work environment, including leadership and personal development, team building, diversity and culture, and managing change. However, this approach is not just for the business world. A lot of people who attend our trainings do so for their own self-development or spiritual growth. Our certification program is one of only a handful of curricula accredited as a school by the International Enneagram Association. It is currently being conducted virtually and combines live sessions with asynchronous learning. Again, find out more at awarenesstoaction.com. Okay, so we were talking about the importance of the significant other to the preserving domain. And we're uh, certainly Kelly represented that to him. It was thinking of Kelly, drawing her picture, looking at her picture that created a, a reason to go on being for him. And it was Wilson, the volleyball, who he painted a face on uh, with his blood. It accidentally happened. He got blood on the volleyball and then noticed, hey, it looked like a face. So Wilson became his best friend on the island. Oh, I'm trying to remember the uh, sidekick from Robinson Crusoe Friday, 
right? Uh, so Wilson was a stand-in for Friday from uh, Treasure Island, I think, or no, Robinson Crusoe, sorry. But these characters were more than just characters. They were his reason for going on being. And he, Rio Jose already pointed out how Wilson became not just his friend, but the devil's advocate, sort of the, um, you know. It was the, like the, his super ego. Exactly right. Yeah. Particularly when they talk about, you know, what happened up on top of the mountain. And I think we'll come back to that. But something that really struck me watching this was his grief when he lost Wilson. Right. I mean, the way he just lays there and is just shattered because this volleyball, you know, floated off and he he could not rescue it. I mean, it was just heartbreaking. And what struck me as I was thinking about it was that he showed a whole lot more grief about Wilson than he did about Kelly. Right. I mean, clearly there's you know, there's there's grief about Kelly and the the end scene between two, the two of them is heartbreaking. But the, the grief there of i have lost this thing that is so important to me um, yeah. again just felt very preserving to me yeah and and actually this uh, demonstrates the the role of relationships in the preserving domain it's like providing the security and he was demonstrating the loss of security by losing wealth yes yes what i also um saw as very preserving was the lack of inner chat like inner dialogue mm that there was in the movie, like maybe another movie with the same character in an island, the character would have seen the character talking to himself, you know, thinking. <laughs> he was quiet all the time. Right. He wasn't even thinking. I mean, he was probably thinking, but we didn't hear it. Right. Only when he talked to the volleyball, to Wilson. Yes. So that was preserving as well. It could have been a transmitting character doing all of that, but it would have been this inner chat that we would have heard. In the movie yes yes imagine robin williams as that character for example right i mean it would have been a steady dialogue the whole time right so so excellent point the second scene for me was around you know he lands on the island and he starts gathering resources and it's a couple of things um uh, first of all it was interesting to me his relationship with the fedex boxes okay uh, clearly fedex was his life this guy you know, uh, his job and his commitment to the company came before anything else, even his uh, relationship with Kelly. So when he's gathering the boxes, it's interesting to me how he is saving them, right? He's figuring, you can kind of see him thinking, well, I'm going to get rescued and I'm going to make sure these damn boxes get delivered to whoever they're going to be delivered to. So there's this hope, perhaps, that he'll be rescued. And uh, so he starts to also set up a little nest for himself on the beach right so did you guys notice anything about that part about how he set up his little uh, tent yeah i mean first i would like to comment on your i mean which is very good the comment on collecting the boxes and since we said that it's a commercial for fedex so it's like a subtle message uh, that this is what our employees live for you live for <laughs> protecting your own right. goods. Right. So it's, it's, and it's a very preserving message as well yes. from a preserving company. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Great point. Great point. Uh, Maria, is there anything you would add to that? Well, he had the boat that he used, like. Yeah, the life raft. After, yes. They made yeah. a tent out of that. Yes, a tent. And then the clothes or whatever things he had to wear <laughs> were all hung. Yes. And in a way that. I just don't do it's i don't resonate <laughs> with that you know i was thinking i would have had all that piled up somewhere you know, <laughs> hanging from a branch but right. not as tidy as he did right yeah that that caught my attention as well right he created a little clothesline and put his clothes there and i i, I was thinking the same exact thing i just <laughs> i just lay them over a rock in the sun let them dry out but no he wanted his nice neat little environment even on this island where nobody else was right 500 miles from from anywhere right. yeah had i had visitors i would have probably done something <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but on my own i mean who cares you right. know I want them dry, yeah, but <laughs> nothing else. So he, he, he gathers the boxes, and eventually he starts to open the boxes, and he starts to look through them and see 
if there's anything useful in there, if there's any food or uh, anything like that. And uh, some of the things that he identified, I think one of them had divorce papers in it. There was a birthday card along with the volleyball that became Wilson. There was a dress and uh, there was uh, a set of ice skates that became very handy for him <laughs> as, as we went into the movie. Throughout, Throughout the, movie, the movie, yeah, yeah, exactly. They were probably his most useful tool. Yeah, I, was, I have to say that I was very disappointed to see the things that were in the boxes. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping that it would be something more useful or food, you know, or, right. yeah, more useful things. Yes. No, we're not. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so he... There's one box that he doesn't open, right? And this box had a, a pair of wings painted on it. And he, you can see him about to open the box, and then he decides not to. And he decides he's going to deliver that box, which he ends up doing at the end of the movie. How did you guys react to him not opening that box? I, I don't know. I mean, for me, the wings are the, the guardian angel uh, wings. And somehow he felt like I protect this box. Uh, so it will, the, so the guardian angel will protect me. It's like a kind of deep, I mean, a protection message as well. Very preserving. Uh, right. A message. This is, this is how I saw it. Uh-huh. All right. And you? Okay. Well, go ahead, Maria. Jose. How, how did you react to that? I, I was biased. I knew that he wanted to just deliver one at least i guess the wings he saw it as a sign of some sort i didn't think about the end yeah, it's interesting to me because i didn't think so when i was watching that I, I didn't think so much about the significance of the wings on the box other than again a plot device to connect the different pieces for me it was about him kind of deciding okay i have this mission and i'm going to deliver this thing and the mission helps to sustain life now, honestly, I'd have ripped that box open in two seconds. I mean, how do you, you know, I'm thinking, there, you know, there might be a satellite phone in that box, right? I mean, you know, with, you know, problem solved, right? Or you know, or a, or, or a sandwich, or fresh boysenberries, or something. So, uh, frankly, I would have ripped the box open and uh, then apologized to whoever you know uh, got angry about it in the end. But uh, but it was yeah. interesting, and I think it was kind of consistent with the character. Yeah. The, the reason I thought it, I mean, I, I, I translated the wings into the guardian angel that mm -hmm. at the last scene, actually, or not the last scene, I mean, the scene before the, actually, yes, the last yeah. scene, the lady came with a truck yes. with the wings to tell him uh, about the direction. So it's, right. it's a kind of an angel coming and the first of, mm -hmm. I mean, taking a new step in life and telling him where to go. Yeah, so he does deliver the box, and the woman, I, I, I don't know what she was, a welder or something, or created art, an artist. and uh, An artist, uh, I guess. Yes, and, and uh, so the wings were kind of her logo, and they were all over the place. And on her truck, when they encounter each other at the crossroads at the end of the movie. After he sets his nest up, he goes off to explore the island. And it was a really interesting scene for me when he was exploring the island. The first time and you know his feet get all chopped up and bloodied and that sort of thing but he's walking along and he walks past this huge stone cliff and there's a little crevice in the cliff and he looks up and there's a plant growing in the middle of this rock right? and he looks at it for a moment and, you know stares at it and then just walks off and for me, that captured a lot about this movie. It's about survival and finding a way to prosper in an inhospitable environment. I'm always amazed when I'm in the desert or something or in a place where there's a lot of rocks. And you see that through pure chance, some dirt has collected in a crevice somewhere. And then a seed has planted and you get this plant growing in this completely bizarre sort of place and for me that's always represented the beauty of evolution right the beauty of uh, chance matched by natural selection okay? that uh, things survive so for me that was just a really telling little detail about how evolution works and it creates these patterns and these tendencies that support the sustenance of life and of our genes. Hmm. Finally, we get to the, uh, he finds a cave, he's in there, and he gets to the point where his toothache has become unbearable. So this is where the, uh, the ice skates come in handy, and he uses one of the ice skates and a rock as a way to um, commit some homemade dentistry 
that again is a pretty painful scene to watch. I can see Mario's face on the video monitor grimacing. And uh, so, so what happens there, guys? Somebody else describe what he does and what happens next. So, Mario, is there you describing? <laughs> <laughs> You're well, emotional about it. <laughs> he removes the tooth, I guess, with yeah. his feet and then almost loses, loses conscience and falls asleep. Yeah, he, he does. He, I, I think he does lose consciousness there from the pain that that would have caused. And then all of a sudden, it's four years later. Yeah. and. I, he was, he had found a flashlight and he was using it and then he forgot, he didn't um, turn it off. Yeah. And I could see myself thinking, oh no, the batteries are going to, <laughs> you know, and it's like, I could see myself worried about preserving stuff. And it did. I mean, yes. Yes. Yeah. later. But yes. Yeah. Yeah. But but on, honestly, I would like to uh, draw your attention to a few small details that happens in the scenes before that and the yeah. scenes w- which are very preserving. The way he started to collect water, mm-hmm. the way he he learned fires oh, right, in order right, right. to cook. These are very preserving. I mean, actually working on his skills to fish, starting by not knowing how to do it, building the, the, the tool itself for... Uh, harpoon for fishing and then after the the four years he became like very skillful in doing it like doing it easy and so so it shows the process of preserving like uh, building the infrastructure of survival uh, food uh, water cooking even uh, even before the scene that you were uh, describing right now which is uh, taking the uh, the tooth off uh, if you look at the cave it's like very well nested cave for the circumstances with, yes, with yes. some lighting, uh, with the with the uh, uh, pocket watch, with the photos, like bringing some right. comfort to him, and with the uh, Wilson set somewhere, and you feel like it's a warm kind of a warm uh, cave somehow. <laughs> it's homey. Right? It's, yeah, it's very his homey. homey. His yeah. homey little cave. Absolutely right. Great point, Tamara. And again, it shows the. Um, the tendency of navigators to skip over all that boring stuff, right? Of Maria Jose <laughs> and I just say, oh, yeah, yeah. He had to learn how to make a fire and open coconuts and save water and cook crab, right? So, uh, yeah, there's all that stuff. Okay, let's move on, right? And, <laughs> and there is this, uh, this uh, like, uh, pattern of building things. Yes. It's like, you know, the water supply uh, line, building the water supply line. Building, I mean, later on, building the raft, which was a, a whole project, and they yes. chose... The whole project management process. Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. He mapped out how many days it's going to take, how many feet of rope that he needs to make, and all of that sort of thing. Yes, absolutely. And the time, and uh, and then he went uh, up to the mountain to see the the wind, and even risk management through the dialogue between him and uh, and uh, Wilson. So there will be when no when the, you uh, right. this kind of whole project management process. So he wakes up four years later. He's a transformed person. He's lost weight. He, his hair and his beard are much, much longer and a different color. He's, he was a little bit pudgy in the, in the beginning of the movie, and now he's, he's ripped, right? He's thin, very muscular, looks like Tarzan almost. Mm-hmm. And, and to Tamara's point, whereas before he struggled to catch fish, the only thing he could catch was a tiny little minnow, but now he becomes this master uh, spearsman who can you know spear fish uh, very effectively during that four years. Are you interested in learning more about our approach to the Enneagram? Go to awarenesstoaction.com and check out our certification program. We offer a clear, concise, business-friendly, and science-minded approach while maintaining the depth of traditional approaches to the system. At Awareness to Action International, we're the leading innovators in the theory and pragmatic applications of this system to all aspects of the work environment including leadership and personal development, team building, diversity and culture, and managing change. However, this approach is not just for the business world. A lot of people who attend our trainings do so for their own self-development or spiritual growth. Our certification program is one of only a handful of curricula accredited as a school by the International Enneagram Association. It is currently being conducted virtually and combines live sessions with asynchronous learning. Again, find out more at awarenesstoaction.com. So we're back and still with Tom Hanks on the island. 
And one morning he hears a strange noise and he wakes up and he yells. I think he yells at somebody to, to stop it or be quiet or something. And um, then realizes, hey, wait a minute, that noise is different. It doesn't belong here. And he goes to investigate and he finds that two sides of, oh, it looks like an, out, an outhouse or a porta potty to me. I'm not quite sure what it was, some sort of shed perhaps, but it looked about the size of a, a, a porta potty. Uh, but two connected sides of it had drifted onto the beach and he's staring at it uh something new you can imagine after four years on this island it's nice to look at something that he hadn't seen in the past four years and then he stands it up and he notices the wind blows it over and he says ah i have an idea and so this is going to serve as a sail the reason he needed this is because when he tried to get off the island before there were a lot of waves out, uh, high waves that he just couldn't get over. He couldn't get over the barrier. So what these sails allow him to do is to get enough speed going to get over these waves and away from the island. Uh, so these are very important. This is very important development. And had it not been for this, he probably would have died on the island. And uh, so we go through a scene of, as Tamer said, the logistics and project management of building a raft and understanding what the wind patterns are, which he had been tracking uh, over that time. So he knew when the winds were going to change and when would be the right time to get out into the shipping channels that he, he needed to be in. There's the part where he realizes he doesn't have enough rope and he gets into a little bit of an argument with Wilson over that. So Maria Jose, go ahead. What's on your mind? I was amazed by the fact that he said that there was not, not enough rope and he couldn't build more because there were no more. He couldn't get any more from the island. I said, how does he know that there isn't any more stuff, I mean, uh, to, to build the, the ropes in the whole island? You know, but he, <laughs> he was tracking the resources and how much there was and for how long those right. were going to last. And that was interesting to me. Yes. And, yes. Uh, and, and then he starts talking about, and I couldn't, I didn't understand it at first. He talked about something that he had done a, a year ago and I thought it was another draft, mm. but then I realized that it was when he tried to commit suicide, but he yeah. tested the rope that he had built and uh, with it, like a fake, with it, log to see if it was strong enough and it didn't work so yes he failed even at committed committing suicide yes and even though they don't show that scene of him doing that it is central to the story right and again it comes back to this question the and what camus said is the only question do we or don't we commit suicide in an absurd world he had come to the conclusion I'm not getting off this island, right? It's just just not happening. Nobody's going to find me. I'm in the middle of nowhere. I might get sick and then suffer a painful death. I might get injured and suffer, suffer a painful death. So he starts to explore uh, ways to commit suicide. And uh, as Mario Jose said, he goes up onto the top of the mountain, does an experiment, and realizes that it won't work. He can't even kill himself if he wants to he is so at the mercy of his environment that even taking his own life is not a possibility for him for me this idea of suicide is one of the reasons why i'm always reluctant to talk about an instinct for self-preservation okay because a lot of people do commit suicide okay? but they don't want to do it in a way it's going to cause them pain you never hear anybody saying i'm going to find the most awful painful way to kill myself and do that. I don't like to think that we have necessarily an instinct for self-preservation. We have an instinct to avoid pain. We have an instinct to do things that will create comfort and avoid pain. And they all enhance self-preservation, but it's not a self-preservation instinct. We have to be careful about that from my view. Um, because you know, some people do commit suicide because they're weighing, they're deciding that the pain of living is worse than the potential pain of taking their life. Okay? But as we see with him, we often find a justification for not committing suicide. He goes on to have this conversation later in the movie. But, uh, but let's go back and talk about why. So he gets off the island, and he is floating 
in the uh, middle of nowhere. And uh, Tamber, why don't you tell us a little bit about what happens while he's floating on the raft? Um, yeah, I mean, he, he sees like uh, all the obstacles, all the challenges. I mean, it's a very rough uh, ride throughout the process. And he started to lose everything, started to lose supplies, started to lose even the, the raft itself getting dismantled and, I mean, get, I mean uh, uh, broke apart uh, to the extent that uh, he started, uh, I mean, in one of these uh, waves, he, he lose uh, Wilson. Yes. And this is where he would go, as we discussed before, he would go after Wilson trying to, I mean, even uh, uh, this, it, it shows how important the relationship was for him, even with an object uh, that created some kind of security, comfort in relationships to the extent that he was about to sacrifice his life trying to uh, rescue this yes. uh, relationship. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we have seen the grief after that uh, yes. about Wilson, yeah. Yeah, so that, that was heartbreaking for me, that that scene. And, you know, Tamara, when you had pointed out about the angels, I'm sorry, the wings and the guardian angel, the, before he loses Wilson, the, the sail, which he had painted those wings on it, go flying mm -hmm. off in a storm, right? So the wings kind of fly away from him. And so that represents the first loss, I think, the first sense of hopelessness. And then then Wilson he loses and at this point he's just given up right he's just laying there he's floating he oh uh he throws the the oars yes yeah. yes to the water yeah. yes he he just lets the oars go he just almost ritually you know dumps the oars yeah. into into the ocean and you know i guess it's a great point Rio, say a sign that i've just given up so he lays there and all is lost and then along comes a big ship to rescue him and do you guys remember what he said when the ship started to go by it was a little hard to hear but did you hear what he said kelly kelly yes he he lifted his arm and, and called out for kelly the the whale was interesting yeah the whale went with him and woke him up when it was important yes yeah. yes not yeah, sure so if that's preserving at all, but it was nice. <laughs> it's 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 a not nice plot device uh, for the yes. movie of the whale that comes up at one point and looks at him, and uh, then, as you said, kind of wakes him up when the ship is about to come by by bursting water up into the air through its spout. Are you interested in learning more about our approach to the Enneagram? Go to awarenesstoaction.com and check out our certification program. We offer a clear, concise, business-friendly, and science-minded approach while maintaining the depth of traditional approaches to the system. At Awareness to Action International, we're the leading innovators in the theory and pragmatic applications of this system to all aspects of the work environment, including leadership and personal development, team building, diversity and culture, and managing change. However, this approach is not just for the business world. A lot of people who attend our trainings do so for their own self-development or spiritual growth. Our certification program is one of only a handful of curricula accredited as a school by the International Enneagram Association. It is currently being conducted virtually and combines live sessions with asynchronous learning. Again, find out more at awarenesstoaction.com. So we're back, and despite... Uh, our concern, Maria Jose, that we wouldn't have much to talk about with this movie. We did find uh, quite a bit to discuss, and we have one more part to talk about in Castaway. And this is after he gets rescued. So the first time we see him, his hair is cut. He is on a small private plane with his coworker, whose wife had passed away. He gets very excited about having ice and a Dr. Pepper, right, with two cups of ice. And you can only imagine what he's going through after having been on a deserted island and subsisting on fish, uh, coconuts, and uh, rainwater. Um, the idea of being on a, a private jet with two cups of ice and a Dr. Pepper must have been uh, quite a relief. So he yeah, goes, and, and, and it's two cups relief. of ice. Two not cups of ice, one. exactly. Not right. only one. <laughs> exactly right. It, I could feel that in general, after he came back, it's a relief, but also overwhelming. Absolutely. Kind of too much. Absolutely. He doesn't need all these things. He's Absolutely. not as picky as he used to be. And, and this is something we'll certainly see, right, in, in, the, in the pieces that follow. But there's also a conversation they're having, and he, he finds out that Kelly 
had remarried or had married uh, someone in his absence, that they had had a funeral for him. Uh, they declared him dead. Uh, so Kelly had to move on with her life, and she does. And so there's a, there's a huge sadness to him on the airplane that we see. It's interesting to um, when they talk about the coffin, that he yes. had a coffin, and what was in the coffin. And it was memories and things, like special things about him. and. It, that's all preserving, you know, yes. kind of keeping all these things that remind me of you. Uh, look, what's more preserving than a funeral, right? I mean, it's, you know, we're embalming the body, okay? We're, we're putting it in the ground where, you know, animals won't get to it in a protected case. And, you know, so, yes, uh, and, and there's a good point. There are these memories, these uh, knickknacks that get put in there just, to, again, to continue that uh, sense of that person still being in some way um, yeah and and i don't think we discussed the scene where he finds his friend the other guy from the plane and he oh, buries him well yes. and also writes down yes. kind of the uh, when he was born and uh, and died yes. and, and everything and got yes. his clothes and took the shoes and, yes which were too small yeah <laughs> yes and absolutely like <laughs> yes yes so he gets back to memphis uh, they have a big uh, homecoming for him at Fed, at the Federal Express headquarters, and he suspects he's going to be reunited with Kelly, but that's not what happens. So, who wants to tell us about what happens instead? Yeah, for for me, I mean, starting from the uh, claim taking him back till the end of the movie is is about the home and the family that he was planning to to have. Versus what happens. I mean, the home and the family that uh, Kelly has uh, has built for herself. So it's. I mean, this whole part of the movie is about that. How did we plan to to have a family and how how it turned to be? So uh, even even uh, if you look at the scene when he came to the airport, the celebration is very humble. I mean, it's it's not like a hotel. Uh, uh, a hall with decoration and so on. It's like in the middle of the operations. Like yes. it's at the airport. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's at the airport. Yeah. And the place that we work at, I mean we're just telling you that we're still trying to be very preserving. And even when he left uh, this celebration and went to the room that he sh uh, he's supposed to meet Kelly and look at the decoration of the room, very uh, humble, very uh, lame i mean no transmission i mean nothing i mean it's just very functional these are chairs with even colors uh, like gray colors uh, all over the place uh, so i mean just very functional kind of uh, yes. decoration yes. yes so he thinks he's going to meet kelly and instead her husband comes in who of all things is a dentist which yeah. is kind of, kind of <laughs> ironic. <laughs> and, uh, and not only a dentist, but a dentist that had done a root canal on him yeah. previously. But he doesn't seem to remember the dentist, which I find odd that, you know, you don't remember your dentist, but, uh, or at least... Uh, but he did remember the one who referred to him. Correct. Because he talked about it before. So the dentist slash Kelly's husband says that, you know, Kelly wanted to be here, but it was just too painful. For her, but then Tom Hanks sees the two of them outside. Uh, she wants to go back inside, but the husband stops her, and you know she's clearly upset, and they leave. Tom Hanks goes back to the hotel where they do have the feast, which ironically was all seafood. It seemed right yeah. there was sushi, Alaskan king crab, shrimp, all these things. I'm thinking, man, can't you get this guy a steak? You know, he's been eating seafood <laughs> for five. You know, I mean, come on, give him a, give him a ham sandwich or something other than seafood. But it was it was uh, kind of interesting. But there's a nice scene where he kind of walks around looking at all the food, which you know this abundance that is now he's faced with and this for me when we talk about the preserving domain we talk about how we're often conflicted in the preserving domain because our ancestors who from whom we've uh, inherited our genes lived in a state kind of like he was on the island right where food is a luxury and we're faced with this contradiction of shall i indulge myself now or should i save for later and we live in a time of abundance right i mean we don't have this sort of 
uh, banquet uh, every day. But, you know, uh, most of us living in today's time certainly have the opportunity for more abundance than our ancestor did and that our genes have evolved for. So it was interesting to me to observe that, particularly him look, picking up the Alaskan king crab leg and being kind of indifferent to it uh, in, a, in a way, which, which was interesting. It was almost disgusted. Yeah. Yeah, it's like he's, he's like full of that. I mean, I mean, I don't, I can't see another seafood, uh, piece of seafood again. Yeah. I just, I I, 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 you're, you're right. So it's not only do I not want to eat another piece of it, but I think, Mario, Jose, what you're saying is almost by the waste of it was disgusting yeah. to him. Is that kind of what you were saying? Yeah. So we see him sleeping or trying to sleep, but he is laying on the bedroom floor. Uh, rather than the bed. I guess that when you sleep in a rock cave for four years, you kind of get used to a certain firmness that most <laughs> mattresses won't meet in a hotel. He, he's also flicking the light on and off. And while he's and actually, doing, he created his own cave with the, with the sheet. Yes, so. <laughs> yes. Good point. Good point. And he is looking at the picture of Kelly. And next we see him going to Kelly's house. She again is now married, living in the suburbs with the dentist and uh, a daughter. Uh, he shows up there and they have what is a pretty awkward exchange, but very real. And what so what's interesting to me as he's talking, so he goes to see Kelly and here are these two people who were deeply in love with each other. And uh, but her life went on. And even though he was still pining for her, she had to accept the fact that he was dead and then move on with her life, got remarried. And so I'm conflicted watching this scene because on the one hand, I'm thinking about what they're going through. And on the other hand, I'm thinking about the husband saying, yo, dude, yeah, come on, this is my house. You know, you go away, right? She, she's my wife now, right? Leave, leave me alone. Okay? So there's that bit of conflict, but they have this conversation and, uh, you know, and you can see them wrestling with, you know, what the hell do we do now, given this situation? Um, we see that she has saved his Jeep, uh, another act of preservation. She kind of saved it, I think, as a, you know, she didn't get rid of it just because it provided her some connection to him, but it also gives him a resource that he needs now to move on with his life. And she also showed him how much she tried to yes. find him. Yes. And it, it, you could see that she put her life on hold to find him. Yes. And uh, that's preserving, but preserving other people, not just the self. Yes. yes, it's interesting because before he leaves, she's pursuing her PhD and she's working on her doctoral thesis. And when he asks her, you know, how come you're not Dr. Kelly? She says, well, I, I put that on hold. And, you know, when you disappeared, my life went on hold. And to me, that was a stab in the heart, right? I mean, that was just such a painful statement to make both her pain and the pain he must have felt to hear that i think were very striking and and uh, do you remember where did they have the, the whole conversation in her house in the, it's kitchen. In the kitchen yeah, yeah. it's in, in the kitchen <laughs> right and, the, and then the garage and then uh, you know yeah. he leaves she goes out uh, you know yelling for him she gets into the car it's as if they're considering that she might go off with him and then, of course, they realize that, you know, no, that doesn't make any sense. And what's interesting to me when he's talking about this to his coworker afterwards, he says, we both did the math. She knew it wouldn't work. She knew she had to go on. I knew it wasn't realistic. But again, it was a very functional approach to things. Okay? It wasn't this you know, again, transmitting kind of romance that we think about, oh, I've been destined to be with you and nothing else will get in the way. But it's, I wouldn't call it transactional necessarily, but there is a very practical element to their decision-making that, that uh, goes into whether or not they get together. Again. And go, going back to this theme, actually, uh, came after him and the car and uh, met, met him and uh, under the rain. And actually, at the end of this scene that he's saying a very simple sentence but it means a lot i mean uh, symb symbolically when it comes to preserving he said you have to go home mm. so it's like i mean it's like it's a symbol of it's this the home is important now i understand that you have built the home and you have to go home so i mean it looks very simple like i mean yes we are in, under the rain and you have to go home but it, i mean to me it's like uh, putting a statement that home is very important and i understand that 
So we, we see him again uh, next. He is in the hotel room. He's talking to his friend about the whole situation. And the thing he is talking about, the hopelessness he felt on the island. And his decision was the only thing he could do was continue to breathe. You just breathe in, breathe out. And that is the preserving activity at its most fundamental. Again, it's, we can think of it as self-preservation, but it's, he's not talking about, oh, I have to live. Oh, I have to, you know, he does say, yeah, I want to go on living, but it's, it's just, it's the act, right? So our drive is to continue to breathe, which enables us to survive, but it's that act that is the focus. And um, so it's a sad, sad moment and, uh, uh, you know, a touching moment. But again, I think a, a real moment. And that's one of the things I liked about the movie is that every conversation that built out of what happened before was not satisfying from a Hollywood ending perspective, but it was what the real conversation probably would have been, okay? uh, which was good. So to, to me, to me, the scene, I mean, where he, uh, he, uh, where they met under the rain and then he brought her back to home. I mean, to me, that was supposed to be the ending. And, <laughs> and it's very interesting that they have created like 10 minutes after that, where he met his friend and had a yeah. discussion and then went to deliver the package and stood up to him. So how did you, how did you see that? How did you, what was your reflection on that? So I, um, I, I agree with you. I mean, people saw that movie and they expected a Hollywood ending, right? Either they're in the car and she goes back home or they get together and they drive off together, right? That would have been kind of the standard Hollywood ending. Uh, but they don't end it there because they deal with, okay, well, what does come next, right? What happens for this guy who's lost everything? I mean, literally, he's lost everything except that Jeep. And what does one do now? And I thought that was an interesting question. So, yeah, it's, I, I, I'm, I'm either way over whether the movie could have ended with him and Kelly in the car or after her getting out of it. Uh, but I like the part that they added to the end of it. I think it worked well. Yeah, me too. And um, I didn't realize at the beginning, but then I noticed how, what's her name? Bettina? She was listening to an Elvis song. Uh, the first oh, time. right, right, right. I didn't and, catch that. And he was a, uh, he really liked Elvis yeah, as well. he was well. a big Elvis fan. Yeah, yeah. So, so there was a connection there, which was nice. Yes, it was. And I, I think, you know, again, the people that I saw the movie with were, well, why didn't he go after her, right? Well, you, know, why, you know, why didn't he go and go after Bettina and live happily ever after with her? But instead, the movie ends with a very vague and open-ended ending right he's at a crossroads he's in uh, the middle of texas the very flat part of the country and literally i mean in the middle of nowhere but in a very different environment than the middle of nowhere he was on the island right so he's facing these choices and the movie ends with him just picking a direction and uh, no actually he he's standing in the middle of the road still uh, hasn't quite decided what to do at the end of the movie. again this is life this is the there's no there's no preserving, oh, I'm going to go, I'm sorry, there's no uh, transmitting of, oh, I'm going to start over, I'm going to create this new thing, I'm going to do something big with my life. There's no navigating of, okay, I've got to reconnect with all my friends, right? And it seems indifferent to that. It's just, what, what am I going to do step by step next and uh, just continue to live? Any other comments uh, before we wrap this up? Uh, well, I, I just want to talk about the poster. It looks like, I mean, really a survival. Po I mean, there are a few posters, I mean, but the main one is the face of uh, Tom Hanks with the beard and, uh, you know, in the background, very shady background of the island. So it's very preserving, I mean, survival kind of, uh, yes. of poster. Uh, I mean, you don't see in any of the posters scenes uh, from uh, uh, the period before going to the island or uh, after the island. So it was right. all about this part of the island, yes. which is a very, uh, even the music, music very, uh, you know, table music kind yes. of. Yes, uh, low key. Nothing, yeah. 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 Nothing really, uh, I don't know, nothing really that yeah. is uh, attractive or uh, or would, would take your attention away from it, the movie itself. That's That's the way I think about it because I thought the music was very effective because it set that tone of not aspiring towards something else it was just you're here be present these are yeah. your circumstances 
Maria Jose, anything you else would add before we wrap up? No, I'm surprised at how much I didn't notice. Uh, it wasn't that much, but there were quite a few things that I didn't see that you saw. And that, that only speaks about my, <laughs> my own biases, which is, I think it's important. I mean, part of this, we're using the uh, movies to portray the um, instinctual biases and our reaction to them and how we interact with them. And this is part of it. That, that's why I bring it up. Excellent point. These, one of the things about movies is a good movie uh, shows real life and captures elements of real life. And these movies we've talked about with preser preserving, navigating, and transmitting domains really do capture that in very effective ways. And by watching these movies and understanding our reactions to them, we can learn an awful lot about ourselves uh, in addition to these three instinctual biases. So thank you, guys. I'm excited. We found so much to say about Castaway. I, too, thought it would be a 10-minute podcast of, you know, let's get the heck off this island. Uh, <laughs> but uh, there, there's a lot to unpack here and a lot to learn about the observing domain. So until next time. You've been listening to the Awareness to Action Enneagram podcast. Thanks for listening, and we hope you'll join us for the next episode. In the meantime, if you've enjoyed the podcast, we ask you to go to wherever you get your podcasts and give us a review. Visit us at awarenesstoaction.com and follow Awareness to Action on social media.